An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. Lecture 17, <clears throat> July 22nd, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last session I had begun to say something about the relationship between dialectic and system. And in this connection, I have kept our final sessions for the real central question that besets any dialectical method. And that is the question whether we can still hold on to the idea of a dialectic at all once we have surrendered the concept of system. This question is an extraordinarily serious and difficult one, and no one should regard it as something already decided, and I myself certainly do not regard it as so. But first I should like to pursue this relationship between dialectic and the concept of system a little further in terms of a problematic that has already emerged within the context of philosophical systems. You will recall, as I pointed out in the last session, that the concept of system, which effectively characterized the rationalist forms of Western philosophy after Descartes, first emphatically appears in Kant as the attempt to develop the minimum range of utterly binding and necessary insights from a single unified point of view. And indeed, the concept of unity and that of system are essentially equivalent for Kant, which is to say that the systematic structure of philosophy in Kant is actually nothing other than a demonstration of the unity of consciousness and the connection between the given contents or facts of consciousness and the unity in question. And post-Kantian idealism subsequently tried to move beyond Kant in a certain sense with considerable rigor by recognizing the incompatibility between the concept of self-sufficient systematicity and the notion of an arbitrary and contingent manifold that is merely furnished from without. It thus attempted to elevate the concept of system to the level of totality, that is to say, to develop all of reality on the basis of thought in a completely imminent or seamless fashion without leaving anything whatsoever outside. And the most impressive attempt of this kind is precisely Hegel's dialectical system, which endeavored for its part not merely to derive the accidental or contingent, namely what is not peculiar to consciousness, from consciousness itself, but even to determine the very form of contingency as a moment of necessity. This conception of system fell into disrepute during the 19th century from two different quarters. On the one hand, it sprang from the positivist side of the natural sciences, which eschewed the a priori constructions of the Hegelian philosophy of nature in particular, along with Schelling's philosophy of nature, a critical development, which eventually came to embrace even the minimum of a priori elements still preserved in the Kantian table of categories or the Kantian system of principles. On the other hand, the concept of system also fell into disrepute for a philosophy which was oriented above all to history and to the category of life, an approach which emphasized the incompatibility of systematic logical constructions with the irrational facts, as they were called, which could not themselves therefore be reduced to the realm of consciousness. A development which in a way already begins with Schopenhauer even if his own attitude to the concept of system certainly remained ambiguous. Such criticism then found its culmination in Nietzsche's influential dictum about the disreputable character of system. After all this, the official or academic forms of philosophy found themselves in a rather difficult and precarious situation as far as the concept of system was concerned. For while on the one hand they were reluctant to renounce the notion that philosophy is the queen of the sciences and that it is possible to unify or to construct all knowledge, all science, from a single unified perspective, they were also of course unable to withstand the force of the critique which had been concentrated upon the concept of system from both of these poles. And this gave rise to certain compromise solutions such as that provided by the rather complex and involved philosophy of Dilthey, which can indeed be described as a kind of positivistic secularization of Hegel, with the concept of system now removed. 
Then there were others who attempted to reduce the concept of system once again to the more modest dimension that it had enjoyed in Kant, while fashioning it in such a way that it could also embrace the full range of the modern natural sciences. This was the solution which was favored by the representatives of the Marburg School, such as Hermann Cohen and Paul Natorp. And there were, finally, other Neo-Kantian currents, such as the Southwest School of Windelband and Heinrich Rickert, which sought to attenuate the concept of system by reducing it to a set of general principles, so that, in effect, it simply became a way of housing the sciences. If we consider the history of the concept of system more generally, we can specifically trace the process of resignation, or perhaps better put, the process of the rise and subsequent resignation of the modern form of metaphysics. Such thought describes an arc which culminates in Hegel before declining into either eclectic or more modest forms of constructive philosophy. The doctrines of Rickert, for example, are particularly characteristic in this regard, for while he polemicized against Leben's philosophy, the philosophy of life, and dedicated a critical book to the subject, he nonetheless felt so threatened by rationalism that he declared that a system should resemble a house where a whole and living human being, Goeth's name naturally be being invoked here, could indeed dwell. This is already, of course, a highly suspect formulation for it proclaims system itself merely as a home for any content that it may possibly accommodate, thus renouncing the claim to comprehend the whole truth or the whole truly as a whole, and effect effectively contenting itself instead with a merely organizational form of thought. One might therefore imagine that the concept of system had thereby been silently interred and that any systematic structure had been reduced to that entirely formal domain where it may successfully be maintained without internal contradiction, in other words, to the domain of pure logic. And indeed, logical positivism claims to provide just such a conclusive and absolutely rigorous systematic logical structure, namely a deductive system in the proper sense, which in a quite unconnected way now stands over against an extreme form of empiricism in an even more radical and modernized manner than before. But it is nonetheless worth noticing that, in spite of this remarkable history, the concept of system has lost nothing of its attractiveness, and that while any philosopher who undertakes to furnish a system of philosophy today already thereby cuts a rather ridic ridiculous figure, for surely only someone who does not know the world can even entertain the idea of trying to capture the whole world in such a butterfly net. The concept of system nonetheless survives in a certain sense all the same. Perhaps I can take this opportunity to point out to you that any conception of the history of mind or spirit, and not only of the history of spirit, but of actual history as well, which somehow imagines that historically surpassed forms of thought would thereby simply disappear, would be all too innocuous. What we find, rather, within the persisting irrationality of the whole, is that these forms, which in truth, in terms of their own claims, have already been overcome, and are now literally obsolete, still continue to exist, albeit, as we should have to say, in a certain decayed fashion and which haunt our transformed world like poisonous substances and create all kind of mischief in the process. And in terms of the historical dialectic, we can find some very good, or if you prefer, some very bad reasons why the ultimately very stringent critique of the concept of system has never actually succeeded in completely eradicating the idea of system, and above all, the need for system. So, just as before, there are still things that resemble systems, albeit in an extremely resigned form, whether simply as an organized way of sheltering the most general scientific principles we need, or alternatively, as a suitable basis upon which everything, can, everything else can then be constructed. I believe that I have already said enough to show that the concept of the whole, or the totality, in terms of the role which it plays in dialectical thought, is intrinsically incompatible with this conception of the whole.
interpreted as the highest or the lowest common denominator, as the case may be. But especially in the contemporary situation in which we find ourselves, where certain systematic approaches also appear to appeal specifically to those of an emphatically scientific orientation. It seems appropriate that I should say something about the concept of system in the new form, which it has now assumed. For the positivists themselves speak of a form of thought which allows them to accommodate everything, to assign everything its proper place, without having to endorse any specific theory. Rather, it seems we could almost say that the less any constructive theoretical power effectively determines the individual moments in question, and thus the more spiritual bond between particular findings disappear, the greater the need appears for some abstract, protective structure where everything else can be accommodated. A kind of totality or accommodation which lacks the moment of conceptuality, of comprehending and understanding, of meaningfulness itself. For these systems in the most recent style are nothing more than organizational schemata, which are measured in terms of whether they are capable of capturing everything without leaving anything outside, and without anything turning up, that they would not already know how to file away. I believe that the contemporary appeal of such systematic or pseudo-systematic structures is not accidental, that it is connected with the way in which the world is experienced by human beings today in a new, and I would like to say, negative manner, precisely as a closed world. Not indeed a closed world in the sense that this was understood in the philosophy of the High Middle Ages, where revealed dogma effectively coincided with the most advanced level of consciousness. But a closed world in the sense that absolutely everything that is possible within experience is already regarded or experienced by human beings as something preformed by society, that the experience of anything new in a serious or emphatic sense is effectively excluded, that the world is moving back, economically speaking, towards the level of simple self-reproduction and is neglecting the task of enhanced reproduction, a movement which, at least as a tendency, has actually been confirmed by many economists today. Thus, this is effectively a world of experience, we might say, where there is no longer really any frontier, where there is no longer anything as yet ungrasped, where everything is already perceived by human beings as something that has been organized in advance. And the need for systematic structure that arises in this new situation is then simply that of finding the conceptual forms, which correspond to this pre-organized character, which are already foisted upon everything that is, namely through the phenomenon of the bureaucratization du monde, through the phenomenon of the administered world. It is characteristic of these systems of the most recent style that they essentially furnish enormous procedural plans or arrangements where everything is expressly assigned its preordained place. That in such systems there is therefore no, ro no room for anything whatever which might transcend them. The great systems of the past, on the other hand, specifically drew their power from the way that the trans transcendence that belongs to consciousness, the transcendence that belongs to spirit, itself a secularization of the divine spirit, has here assumed imminent form in relation to all that is actual and particular. From the way these systems thus attempted to comprehend even what is not spirit, as something that is spiritual nonetheless, to comprehend what is not spirit as more than it is. This tendency on the part of the older systems to lend a kind of meaning to what merely is by grasping it within the context of the totality is something that has completely vanished today. All that we encounter now are effectively gigantic bureaucratic plans which encompass everything within themselves and where the decisive criterion is simply the idea of a seamless fit between everything already contained in them. Thus these systems provide the very opposite of those dialectical attempts which have exercised such influence on philosophy since Fichte. Such systems are exclusively concerned with pure non-contradiction, and insofar as this non-contradiction is not secured through the content of experience, it is transposed precisely to the merely methodological level.
that is to say, to the merely procedural level. This means that the categories must be selected in such a way as to establish a seamless continuum between the different sciences that deploy them. Here I am thinking about all of the system developed by Talcott Parsons, namely the structural functional theory of society, which is currently playing such an extraordinary role as a kind of cover theory for empirical research, not only in North America, but now perceptibly, so it seems to me, in Europe as well. The decisive methodological idea here is to project a system of categories which will permit us to grasp all of the individual sciences within the realm of the so-called human sciences, or the social sciences in the broadest sense of the term, basically in terms of the same categories. He specifically demands this for psychology and sociology, and it is not difficult to show that he also expects much the same with regard to economics and sociology, and that sociological criteria of successful and unsuccessful functioning operative here are essentially derived from Keynesian economics. We must adopt this critical, and I think it is important to draw your critical attention to these things precisely because I believe there is nothing more dangerous for contemporary consciousness than a false sense of security, and because I believe that the greatest temptation for us today is not so much that of extravagant intellectual flights as the, as the desire for protection or security. What I basically mean to say to you is this. One of the specific theses of Parsons, Parsons's theory is that we should develop categories which will allow us to formulate sociology and modern psychology, which is also how he regards analytic depth psychology in much the same kind of terms. As a conscientious scholar, of course, he certainly acknowledges that we cannot simply assume continuity between psychology and sociology without further ado. And indeed, as is well known, this difficulty has already been encountered by Max Weber, who, while he also constantly insisted that his sociology was not itself a psychology, was never really able to separate his own concept of understanding decisively from the concept of psychological empathy. But in this regard, I think we must say even more radically that in the context of an antagonistic society, the laws which govern society and those which govern the individual are widely divergent from one another. That is to say, from the substantive point of view, that social laws are pur purposive, rational ones, which are defined by the process of exchange. As Max Weber, and indeed to a large extent also Talcott Parsons recognized, whereas the sphere which we characterize as that of psychology in the genuine sense specifically embraces those dimensions in human beings, which are not simply exhausted in such rationality. If we, if we do not fear being accused of putting this into banal fashion, we might even say without really violating the truth too much, that psychology in the emphatic sense is always concerned with irrational phenomena. In other words, with all those phenomena which arise wherever particular individuals withdraw from the demands of rationality upon them by society as a whole. A rationality which is actually no full or satisfying form of rationality anyway, and develop within themselves psychological sy symptoms and co complexes which signify the opposite of those demands. In other words, for reasons which are grounded in the development of society itself, namely on the basis of the simple fact that society depends upon the way it constantly expects various forms of sacrifice and renunciation from the individual, but without ever really making good on this sacrifice and renunciation, for which it actually promises some rational compensation. And it follows from this intrinsically contradictory structure of society itself that the psychological constitution of particular individuals and the laws under which particular individuals are to be grasped are the very opposite. We might almost say of those laws under which the social totality as a whole itself stands. And if instead of acknowledging this contradictory relationship between the laws of psychology and the laws of sociology and defining it in more concrete terms, we attempted to abstract from it, thus presenting us with a third and higher universal level, which is binding for the sphere of sociology and for the sphere of psychology alike. 
we would simply end up with something wholly abstract and attenuated that could do justice neither to the concrete requirements of sociology nor to those of psychology. Thus, the demand for continuity of concept formation and application in systematic domains of this kind finds itself fundamentally compromised from the very start, for it is itself already contradicted by the substantive structure of the moments or by the structure of the contents which it is supposed to be addressing. In these critical reflections, you will encounter once again the same dialectical issue which we have emphasized throughout these lectures, namely this. In contrast to merely subjective reason, to mere method, to the idea of forms externally applied by the subject, we must bring out objectivity as an independent moment, must emphasize that every kind of categorical form which is not developed as much through contact with the object in itself as it is by reference to the classificatory or other logical needs of organizational rationality will thereby inevitably violate the truth. I am speaking about types of system which are highly characteristic of our time and which, as I predict, will soon emerge in even more encompassing forms. That is to say, the more the administered world also comes to be reflected in what we can describe as a sort of administrative logic or administrative metaphysics. Now these structures typically proclaim a remarkable kind of neutrality, something which is expressed in Parsons's system, for example, by the way the concepts of functional and dysfunctional are employed as the sole criterion in relation to a specific structure of society, as a criterion for the truth or untruth, the legitimacy or illegitimacy of the structure of society. The sole question is whether such social order functions or not, where the tackedly assumed criterion of functioning is the ability of the order in question to maintain or preserve itself, even if this transpires at the cost of terrible sacrifices, even if the self-maintenance of such a systematic social order proceeds at the expense of the interests of human beings themselves. Thus, all we are basically concerned with here is the logical form of identity, is the fact that such a structure maintains itself as such, and precisely though this identity of the system with itself, irrespective of what it actually relates to, namely the human beings who are included in it, the neutrality which is supposedly preserved here is revealed as a mere appearance. For this kind of thinking, which seems to be nothing but a means of conceptual organization, effectively becomes a form of apologetics for the actually existing social order, quite irrespective, quite irrespective of how this order relates to the interests of human beings. The harmonizing tendency of such neutral th thought, which arises from the way its own categorical forms help to make contradictions invisible, thus ends up serving the apologetic needs of the existing order. In other words, the actually prevailing social contradictions are not registered by such thought, and the latter thereby ends up justifying the existence as such, and effectively offering recommendations about how the continued functioning of the existent may be secured. It is not recognized that the very contradictions which are underestimated by the systematic categorical framework deployed also drive beyond the existing system and could lead towards one that is quite different. I might point out here that the widespread positivist notion of a neutral form of thought, in contrast to one supposedly based on more or less arbitrary value systems, and particularly standpoints, is itself an illusion that there is no such thing as so-called neutral thought, that generally speaking, this alleged neutrality of thought with regard to its subject matter tends to perform an apologetic function for the existent precisely through its mere formality through the form of its unified methodological and systematic nature, and thus possesses an intrinsically apologetic, or if you like, an inherently conservative character. It is therefore just as necessary, I would say, to submit the concept of the absolute neutrality of thought to thorough critical reflection, as it is to do the same for concept of thinking in terms of standpoints, with regard to which we have already heard some particularly hostile observations on the part of Hegel. In this connection, I would also like to say a few words about that specific form of the concept of system, 
which we repeatedly encounter in the most advanced Western form of positivist thought, and specifically in the social sciences, and which is also invariably invoked when we attempt to construct some kind of whole in contrast to the mere registration of individual facts. This is the well-known concept of a frame of reference, as the Americans call it, which could be rendered in German as Bezug system or coordinate cord, uh, cord, fuck, coordinating system, a relational system or coordinated system to which the individual data can then be related. It is precisely in the context of positivistic empirical research that we constantly encounter the question regarding the appropriate frame of reference, and we are constantly told that some such relational system is indispensable. And for positivist thought in particular, it often seems as if the possession of such a frame of reference to which we can refer the data that have been collected and classified relieves us of further contact with the content itself, with gathering of the material itself, and as if the real intellectual and scientific achievement consisted in the process of subsumption, this coordination of the accumulated data in such a frame of reference. I believe that this conception is quite mistaken. It seems to me that the notion of a frame of reference actually dissolves that continuity or interconnection between facts and thoughts, which I have already tried to clarify for you a little in terms of dialectical categories, and thereby transforms it into a purely technical matter, or a sort of dogmatically arrested perspective. It is typically the case when such a frame of reference is demanded that the latter is not supposed to require any legitimation. That is, no one insists that the frame of reference itself be specifically justified, either in theoretical terms, or even in terms of the material to which it is applied. It is rather that one just needs to possess a frame of reference, if one is somehow to accommodate the relevant data that have been collected in such a relational system. In this way, the dialectical relationship between the fact Factical material and the so called relational system, or the conceptual dimension, is effectively broken in favor of the mere subsumption under categories. And that is not the worst thing either, it seems to me, for what is really problematic here is the fact that this frame of reference itself has an arbitrary character to it. In other words, it is as if we are encouraged to devise just the kind of organizational schema that will accommodate as much as possible and possesses certain advantages of logical elegance, although it is not itself actually derived from theory or from the concept of the object in question, and could basically just as easily be replaced by another schema. It is actually thus, in the literal sense, an act of intellectual administration, a sort of procedural schema which is forced upon us in the bureaucratized world of spirit, as it is in the realm of bureaucracy more generally without ever actually being legitimated in relation to the matter itself. And so we often see how apparent chicks of every kind, the producers of memoranda, who know how to apply the right foundations, and all those people who are principally interested in presenting their ideas in the most skillful manner in order to secure some financial reward or some particular position, generally show a remarkable gift for fitting the individual things with cons which concern them into such a frame of reference. And while this may well create the impression that it is indeed the whole which has been comprehended, that the whole was indeed in question here, what we are actually dealing with in this connection is simply a, pre a presentational schema rather than a schema of the matter itself. But it should be obvious that such a schema is inevitably rigid and formalistic in character, precisely because it accommodates everything so readily and is designed to encompass everything within itself. But in addition to this, the idea of a frame of reference also seems to me to have a very sinister aspect to it. For precisely because such a frame of reference, abstractly ready-made or factic, is externally applied to the facts it is supposed to grasp like a solid or palpable thing. It becomes something like an article of faith, however vacuous or nugatory it may be. Whenever in the course of a discussion with sociological colleagues we encounter the question, 
Well, what is your frame of reference? You can generally be sure that the meaning behind the question is this. Just come clean and tell us what your theoretical ideas are and admit that perhaps the framework of your views about society involves certain ideas which do not fit in with the schema of this society itself and even endanger it. The reification of social or philosophical understanding which is implicit in this concept of a frame of reference thus also has a very precise social function. Fred helps to make our thought appear solid and reliable, helps us to reduce it to a rigid underlying relational system that can easily be labeled in terms of one of today's readily available worldviews or ideologies, as people like to put it, and that is precisely what strikes me as sinister in this connection. It is very interesting to note that the only function which has remained over from the idea of system here is that of a formal sense of security. That system here is no longer really meant to signify, as it did in the idealist period, that thought is at home everywhere, that thought comes to itself in and through the world, that thought returns to spirit as its home. Rather, thought now finds security by escaping into forms of conceptual organization, where, provided it is clear enough to decide on the most suitable frame of reference, relatively little can ever disturb it. And if a spurious metaphysics and a spurious logic of science effectively complement one another in an almost demonic fashion today, I believe that this is nowhere more evident than at this very point. In other words, the idea of a frame of reference is the scientistic form of the new need for security and is also worth much the same. I think I have thus shown you something of the relevance, which to my mind still seems to belong to dialectical thinking in our contemporary situation. On considering the, devel the developments which I sketched out at the beginning of our session, you may well think that dialectical thinking has also now finally descended to the underworld, that the speculative moment of such thinking and all the other related things which have fallen victim to decisive criticism must effectively spell the end of dialectic itself. And I have no wish to gloss over the situation here. As far as the technological development or the streamlining of thought is concerned, the idea of dialectic has indeed been left behind. Rather, as Valerie suggested, that the practices of the poet or artist seem to have been left behind by the white-coated experimental scientist who operates his array of flickering instruments without ever getting his hands dirty. Yet I believe that dialectical thinking alone in its anachronistic features, and if you like, in its powerlessness, before the over overwhelming tendencies of current reality is capable of disclosing the dimension of untruth involved in those seamless and streamlined categorical forms that are increasingly coming to prevail today. For this dimension of untruth can no longer be recognized at all within the framework of the currently existing scientific approach itself, precisely because thought no longer acknowledges any frontiers here precisely because there is no longer anything that in some sense remains outside this fatal structure of imminence. In other words, it seems to me that dialectical thinking alone is capable of calling the administered world by its proper name, even if it looks very likely that the administered world will swallow everything up into itself. That for an unforeseeable length of time, this overwhelming power may well efface the kind of thinking for which I have been attempting to furnish certain models here but I believe it is also part of the historical dialectic that under certain circumstances, precisely what is anachronistic possesses a greater contemporary relevance and significance than that which can claim to be most relevant and significant today, at least on the surface, namely in terms of what functions best within the given forms and structures.